I, you know, again, I don't want to belabor the point on Trinitarianism. Uh, and some of the best Christians in the world happen to believe in the Trinity. Uh, though they don't tend not to understand it. It's a mystery, as they themselves admit. The challenge is, honestly, and this is the last thing I'll say on Trinity, and then we'll, we'll move forward in true unity. The problem really started with Plato in some ways. And when New Testament Christianity passed through Greek philosophy, it came out different on the other side. As far, this is a horrible oversimplification, but for our sakes, I'll just try to be simple that Plato believed in these forms, these ideal forms, that all we see in life are just shadows of the real object that exists in its ideal form in some other sphere. It's the object behind us, and it's just casting shadows on the cave in front of us. If there's anything ideal, then it would be the greatest of its form, uh, the greatest of its kind. Uh, if you see an elephant in the earth, there's some ideal elephant that exists elsewhere. If you see humanity, it's a sorry, kind of fuzzy reflection, just a shadow on the cave wall of the divinity that lies behind it. And so if there is some kind of perfection, it's invisible and unapproachable to us. It lies somewhere behind our consciousness, but it's perfect, and that's God. Now, since it's an ideal, it has to be individual in its idealness. Uh, there can't be diversity. It has to be unity. It has to be, it, it's called monism, mon, mono, only one. And since the Greeks were so focused on just having one ideal perfection, then when you take Christianity with its view of a father and a, an only begotten son, and a spirit will take those three and force them through Greek philosophy. And what do you get on the other side? You get the doctrine of the Trinity. You get if the three have to be one somehow. And I don't completely understand, but it's three and one and one and three, and they're the same substance, uh, just different manifestations of it. They're still trying to wrestle with the diversity they see in Scripture, but Greek philosophy has forced them to end up with only one when all is said and done. To me, I find it ironic when Trinitarians accuse Latter-day Saints of polytheism, which is just a scare tactic rhetorically. Because oh, polytheism immediately makes you think of like the Greek pantheon and the Roman pantheon and the Egyptian pantheon and all these gods for different days of the week and different substances and different purposes. No, that, that's not... If that's polytheism, then no, Latter-day Saints in no way are polytheistic. Oh, but you believe in a separation of the Father and the Son. You believe that you can become like God. and uh, That's not polytheism the way you're using the term. And I always chuckle because in early Christianity, the Jews made fun of Christians and called them polytheists because they believed in a Father and a Son and the Holy Ghost. And that's not the radical monotheism of the Old Testament, where it's Jehovah and Jehovah alone. And yet even that, it's like, well, Elohim, Jehovah, is there a son of man? How does it? It's confusing all across the board. But to understand the source that we're studying here, Christ, who sees his Father as a separate being and prays to him, that he might hold on to his oneness with the Father, and not just hold on to it, extend it to others so that we can be one with them and one with each other as well. So much, the grand finale, the crescendo of all this farewell discourse, this sermon after supper leading up to Gethsemane is oneness through the glory of God. His truth, his light, his work. And then that crescendo is crowned by the act of the atonement itself. Christ suffering in Gethsemane and being crucified on Calvary. And then rising in glory on that first Easter morn. Do you understand what... I hope I'm doing justice to this. I, I, I can't. But I'm trying. And my prayer, along with Christ's, or alongside Christ's prayer, is that we understand the kind of oneness 
that exists through the Lord's glory. If we're ever going to be perfect in one, as the Lord says in this verse, it's going to come because we're in Christ, participating in His perfection, accepting His grace, acknowledging that grace in others, realizing that He is making them at one with Him, just like He's making us at one with Him. And if that's the process, and we all become at one in Him, then that's where we become at one with one another. Sound like Zion to me. <laughs>